this Veritas Forum will be about Christianity versus atheism. We have with us Peter Payne from the United States. He has a PhD in philosophy. He will be uh, speaking on behalf of the Christian faith. And we have also Henrik Savela from the Freethinkers Association in Helsinki. He will be speaking on behalf of the skeptic, humanistic view in this. And uh, there has been since 1992, first, first Veritas Forum was in 1992 in Harvard in the USA, and uh, there have been some 200 occasions since that. And the first in Finland was in 2012. It is the student OPCO in Finnish, student mission in Swedish that is arranging this here. So I will now present our moderator, Carl Granberg, student worker in, in Vasa and Jakobstad. He will be moderating the discussion and see that it runs smoothly and, and so. So that's it. We're very glad to have you both here and to have you all here that you've arrived. And so we'll just get started, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tulbjörn. Uh, we can invite the speakers. Uh, I'll just present the format. By the way, who here uh, is an English speaker? Or English is your strongest language. How about Swedish? Get a feel for the room. How about Finnish? There are a few Finnish speakers. Allah. A very warm welcome and thank you Tulben so much for presenting. Tulben works here and you might have seen him around a uh, representative of the church on campus. And very happy to be here in um, Jakobstad, Vietasari. But without further ado, we are going to get to the speakers. I'd just like to tell you the, the setup. So we're going to let each of them have 16 minutes to present uh, some material. Then they'll be doing some kind of rebuttal, uh, five minutes each, and then a wrap up, three minutes each. And then we'll be opening up the floor to you guys to respond and come with your questions that you've been saving up all week or all year or all your life. And you really want to get it out, this is your chance. So we're going to love to hear from you guys too. But let's let the first speaker stand up, which is. We need to change this. Peter Payne, and you're going to yes. get his presentation ready. Okay, it's good to be here. Uh, I'm uh, taking the Christian position. You might wonder, what kind of Christian am I? I'm a person who believes what historic Christianity has affirmed. So what uh, Catholics, Protestants, uh, Orthodox have believed in common, I believe. Uh, I believe uh, in the reliability of Scripture. Uh, but I should also say that my faith does not stand or fall on details within Scripture. So when I'm looking at the, the topic today, I'm looking at the Christian faith generally, and I don't think that it is necessary for me to defend every detail that one has within the Bible. Uh, part of the reason for that, there's an awful lot in the Bible that I believe because the Bible teaches it, not because there's independent evidence for it. So if one is looking at the question of the evidence for the Christian faith, one needs to look at those core beliefs, those things which are foundational to what Christians believe, and address those. I've been in debates in the past where sometimes the debater has picked up little things they didn't like about the Bible, and that's really extraneous to the question of the, the truth of the Christian faith uh, by, by itself. Atheism here, uh, I'll mean what's sometimes called naturalism. Naturalism is the view that nature is, that, that, that rather that all that is real is physical, and also that everything ultimately is explainable by the laws of physics. Now, atheism can be understood as simply a denial of uh, what the what what denial of that God exists, but then that includes Buddhists. It includes people who believe in something, and I don't think it's a debate between myself and this grab bag of everything that doesn't everyone who does not believe in God. So the position that I'm uh, criticizing atheism is naturalism, which in fact Hendrik uh, adheres to that position himself. If one goes with the general view of what uh, atheism is, then one drops out the principal argument that I think atheists have 
for believing that atheism is true, namely most of them think that science shows that God does not exist. And I'll come back to that in a second. A third thing I want to say is there's no objective way of weighing evidence. So when one asks, where does the evidence point? Actually, the evidence can give you things to work with, but doesn't tell you how to weigh those evidence, the evidence. There is no logic that tells people how much weight you should give to evidence that supports a conclusion. It may support the conclusion, but how much is open to debate? Because of that, you can have equally intelligent people coming out with quite different conclusions given the same evidence. Someone asks, where, what does the evidence point? Actually, it's not just the evidence, one has to weigh it, one has to consider the arguments that are given on both sides. Thinking about evidence from science, I want to start off by saying that I think the success of science provides good reason to believe there are no gaps in the order of nature. Now, what I mean by a gap is some aspect of the order of nature that cannot and never will be explained by science. And I think the success of science from the largest scale to the smallest scale, it hasn't found the gaps that it need to be filled in by God uh, doing miracles. So I think there are no gaps in the order of nature. But a second point here is I think a gapless order of nature accords well with the Christian view of God. So I wanna explain that a little bit. Christians believe that God is both all powerful and all knowing. Being all powerful, he created a possible universe. Being all-knowing, he knows all the possibilities. So he knows he can create a universe which is exquisitely ordered, where he doesn't have to fill in gaps. And I don't think it should be surprising that if God is aware of that, that God would create such a universe. So my thesis is that God has created an exquisitely, wonderfully ordered world, one without gaps that he needs to fill. Now I wanna make a distinction between a call order of nature miracles and specific point miracles. It's my own terminology, so I have to explain. Order of nature miracles are miracles that God needs to do simply to sustain the order of nature on a day-by-day -day basis or on a regular basis. Isaac Newton thought that God needed to adjust the orbits of the planets occasionally. If that were true, that would be an order of nature miracle. Specific point miracles are miracles that are not needed to sustain the order of nature, but which God does at specific points and for specific purposes. Now, science actually is silent about the possibility of specific point miracles. It tells us when we look around the world, we find the world is extremely well ordered, whether one is looking at neurons firing the brain or one is looking out uh, galaxies, one finds a world that can be explained by science which I say actually accords very well with the Christian faith, but it doesn't tell us whether God would do miracles on occasion for specific purposes. And those don't show up in the science scientist's laboratory. Another point to be made is that all the miracles in the Bible are specific point miracles. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that when it rains, it only rains because God makes it rain. So despite the fact that some people say religion arose out of ignorance, not knowing why things happen in the natural world, that is not part of the understanding of God in the Bible. God may bring rain or he may bring drought, but the natural processes are never said to be done by God himself. So that's not a, that's not a Jewish and Christian concept of God. For them, God has revealed himself in history. He's revealed himself in, in people's lives. And some of, that, some of his actions are miracles in the strong sense, namely that they are exceptions to the laws of physics. Now, whether miracles have taken place, therefore, is something that one has to address case by case and ask, what's the historical case for this miracle or that miracle? And one has to weigh the evidence and come to some kind of conclusion, but science will not tell you that. Science does not even tell you that miracles are very improbable to ever happen because uh, it's, they happen rare enough, uh, on a rare enough occasion, that scientists simply don't tell us whether specific miracles uh, happen. There are some objections to that thesis, which I can come back to later, and Hendrik may raise a couple of those I can respond to. It turns out also that the basic physical constants are fine-tuned for the possibility of life. They seem to be fine-tuned. If you had the gravitational force slightly stronger or weaker, or these other basic physical constants slightly different, then nothing like intelligent life would be possible. Here's a quote from Stephen Hawking from uh, The Grand Design. The emergence of the complex structures capable of supporting intelligent observers seems to be very fragile. 
The laws of nature form a system that is extremely fine-tuned, and very little of physical law can be altered without destroying the possibility of the development of life as we know it. Were it not for a series of startling coincidences in the precise details of physical law, it seems that humans and similar life forms would never have come into being. As you probably know, Stephen Hawking is not a theist. He is an atheist. His explanation is we live in a multiverse where all possible universes are actualized. And if all possible universes are actualized, even if universes which permit life are very, very rare, we have to be in one of those universes. So that's his explanation. But nonetheless, it's worth noting that there's an extraordinary fine-tuning of the basic physical constants, which certainly lends support to the idea that there is a designer, namely God, behind it. Another issue to address is conscious mind. I think this is a serious problem for the materialist, for the, for the naturalist. There was a book that came out in 2012 by Thomas Nagel, uh, atheist at New York University, but he is not a naturalist, and the book was entitled Mind and Cosmos, Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Concept of Nature is Almost Certainly False. By the way, he's not opposed to evolution. He says the Neo-Darwinian project is a project to give a completely natural explanation of all of evolution. And he thinks that's not possible because there's more to reality than simply what is there out in, in the physical world. He wrote an earlier article called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? He chose a bat because bats fly around in a, clay, in a cave where it's, where it's pitch dark. They can't see anything, but they make these chirping sounds. The sounds bounce off the walls of the cave, come back to the bat, and the bat is able to avoid flying into other bats and is able to grab onto the ceiling of the cave. And he, Thomas Nagel assumes, and I think he's right, that when bats are flying around a cave, they actually have an experience of their environment. It's not a visual experience because it's not through the visual mode of sensation. It's a different kind of mode of sensing their environment. So the question is, what is it like to be a bat? Is there some fact about what it's like to be a bat? And presumably, if bats do have experience, there is a fact of what, from the bat's perspective, it's like to fly around in the cave. He then says, suppose you knew everything you could possibly know about a bat, all the physical facts, how the sound waves come in, how they get processed, how that enables the bat to avoid flying to other bats. If you knew all the physical facts, would you know what it's like to be a bat? And my response to that is no, I wouldn't. And most people's response is no, you wouldn't. But if in fact there is a fact about what it's like to be a bat, then there are facts which are not physical facts. But if a person says there's nothing but the physical universe, it ought to be the case that all facts ultimately are physical facts. So if it's not the case here, so much the worse for naturalism, and Thomas Nagel takes that kind of argument. There is another way of viewing uh, conscious experiences, which is uh, advocated by John Searle, atheist professor at, he was at uh, Berkeley, at University of Berkeley, California, the rediscovery of the mind. Uh, he viewed conscious experiences as being emergent properties. If you want, in the q and I'll explain why it is I think that his view doesn't work. But I think this is the most popular view amongst many atheists that, that are out there. Next, thinking about historical evidence. Jews and Christians, their faith rests on historical claims. Not like Buddhism or other things, their faith rests on claims of how God has acted in history, uh, sometimes through miracles. And again, I'm using a strong definition of miracle here. How God has spoken to various people. So it's believed that God spoke to Moses and appeared to him in the burning bush and spoke to the prophets and spoke to Jesus and spoke to various apostles. It also is claimed that God has shown himself to individuals, both past and present, through events and through experiences. If you've been around Christians very long, you've heard stories of really quite extraordinary experiences that they had, some of which can be accounted for simply as coincidences, Others of which seem, hmm, that is puzzling. What is going on here? So those also come into God's acting within human history. I should also insert here that Christianity also depends significantly on the coherence and wisdom of the message throughout the Bible. One significant for my thing as a Christian was I, I, I found I loved scripture and I enjoyed studying it and thinking about it. And the more I studied it, the more I'm I was impressed with how the message of scripture holds together and how much wisdom there is within it. So that's a significant thing for Christians as well. 
This raises the question, however, how much evidence does it take reasonably, reasonable, reasonably to believe that a miracle has taken place? So, for instance, sometimes we give a talk on the case for the resurrection. I won't go into the details of it here in my opening talk, but I follow the case for the resurrection by another lecture which I entitled, But Dead Men Don't Rise. So there's actually a surprisingly good historical case to be made for the resurrection of Jesus, where one can see that, the, that Jesus rising from the dead actually fits the facts, and by facts I mean what scholars agree to, much better than anything else. But even though you have a strong historical case for it, there's the philosophical question of what does it take to believe that miracles ha have happened. Now, I think there needs to be a bar of evidence considerably higher for reports of miracles than for ordinary events. Part of the reason for that is that there are plenty of false reports. And you have to be able to separate out false reports from true reports. So you have to have a higher bar of evidence. The question, how much higher does that bar of evidence need to be? Now, many miracle reports seem quite well attested. I won't go into those, but if you read some of the stories, some of them seem quite well attested. So on what grounds do atheists contend that no past reports have sufficient evidence to justify believing in them? So they'll typically give a theoretical reason from science saying it can't happen, but then they'll say there actually have been no reported miracles that have sufficient evidence to cause us to believe that any miracles have actually taken place. The problem with this is this is in danger of circular reasoning. Uh, <clears throat> so a circular reasoning is assuming the conclusion at the start. You want to argue for something, you shouldn't assume it as you start. So if the reason why the bar of evidence for miracles is set at such a high level, if the reason is that one already believes that miracles cannot happen, then he, she is guilty of circular reasoning. So why is the bar set so incredibly high? Well, the answer is usually because we have good reason for believing they can't happen. Well, science doesn't tell us they can't happen, so why do you say it can't happen? So given that science is silent about the possibility of specific point miracles, it is hard to see what rationally justifies putting the bar so high. Now, high, how high it needs to be depends on such questions as whether the idea of God makes sense to you, whether ethics needs some sort of foundation, there are a variety of things which come into play for that. So a thesis that I have is the historical case for the resurrection of Jesus is actually quite strong. That Jesus physically rose fits the facts recognized by scholars far better than any proposed naturalistic explanation. Another thesis is that there are many reports that go beyond what coincidence reasonably can explain. I'll give one illustration here towards the end. It's a small thing, but it happens a lot with Christians. There was a friend of mine who's a musician who had, who had had one uh, record, vinyl, label, vinyl records, and he was going to have a professional done recording for his second one. And a friend who had access to professional studios in Hollywood had arranged to have some musicians come in and to work with him. Well, the middle of the night, 2 a.m., he gets a phone call from the East Coast, and his friend says, I'm calling you. I know it's, I know it's 2 a.m. for you, but I've been thinking about you and feel like I need to call you. Is there something I should be praying for you about? So yes, in fact, I have this one opportunity to do this recording. Now, he's not a person who would normally call people in the middle of the night. Those kinds of things happen for Christians. They don't show that the Christian faith is true. It can be viewed as well. That, that, can, that can happen sometimes. But if you're around Christians, you find that those kinds of reports are actually quite common. And that adds to the credence of believing that, in fact, the Christian, faith, God, the Christian God is not only work in the past, he's also a work in the present. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and round of applause. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, and you kept within your time by the second. <laughs> so let's hear Henrik. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I have some problem with it, my text because when, when, when I printed it, I noticed that uh, the, right, uh, the right end of the lines were not printed very well, so sometimes I take some description here, or I decipher the I'm a of text. All right, as I was introduced, uh, I'm an atheist, freethinker, humanist, skeptic, 
uh, rationalist, emotional rationalist, if you want to. So why Christianity or any reli reli religion at all? I mean, we atheists treat all re religions the same way. When I'm now uh, mentioning Christ Christianity, every argument goes for any other religion too. We are very dem democratic about uh, and, and uh, we are treating all gods the, the same way. Few con uh, people contemplate very much which they, uh, why they believe as they do. If they, if they have any religion, rel rel religious conviction. Only very few gather systematically information about several re religions, how they try to argue for their case, then putting the data in an Excel and looking what comes up, out. Just about everyone who has a re relig religious conviction just copies it from their parents, who's copied it from their parents, and so on. When a specific religion gets a grip on a society, it usually keeps that grip very long, as the way it's conveyed to the next generation is so effective. It's so effective. In the bad old days, people could live their whole life without ever getting to know about other religions, let alone that there, there, could, uh, there could be a rel uh, religious-free alternative. I'm naturally, naturally not criticizing the socialization process. Without it, we wouldn't survive. But it's good to know that it, has, it also has its dangers. It's worth mentioning that today, many parents who belong to the church don't have, the, have their children baptized because they want to leave the choice for the children to be taken when they are uh, mature to take this decision for themselves. That the religion is poured in the mind of the infant almost from, almost from day one. The infant has no possibility to understand that what his parents and closest tell it, tell it is not true. Or should we think that the infant who is led to the, to the secrets of, for, for example, the Hindu re religion or the Edda uh, is the... Uh, it just uh, gets just the whole truth and nothing but the truth when it comes to religion. I mean, in all uh, societies, in all bigger uh, cultures, there are religions, but they are transferred to the next, to the next generation in the, in the same way. The situation nowadays, in, in, uh, at least in the more developed countries, is naturally already much better than it used to be. As an individual can get access to diverging information about religion and atheism at a very early stage. In all developed countries, both the belonging to the churches and, and believing in their uh, ideologies have decreased for quite some time. This is naturally nothing new. But it's more, uh, worth mentioning, uh, it worth be, uh, it worth keeping in mind that the secularization process seems to be unstoppable. Equally important is to remember that when you think of yourselves as, as Christians, there's not only one Christianity, but a great number of different groups with even quite different views on, the variety, on, on a variety of issues regarding their religion and how their religion looks upon the world. When one speaks about Christianity, the speaker usually thinks that his own or her own group represents the only true version of the, or at least a superior one. I don't think it takes too much in introspection or self-criticism to understand that, uh, that, one's, uh, that one's own religion or some specific, specific version of it might not be much better than all the others. Although this doesn't require very much intellectually, it's still almost impossible to agree, to agree with this, as one's own religion is so emotionally and deeply embedded in one's mind. And often also in the social structures in which the subject is living. This applies naturally only 
to the more active believers. For those who think of themselves as, as the term goes, cultures, cultural Christians, well, they don't just care very much. At least in Finland, they are, are the, they are the majority of Christians. It's worth mentioning that less than a quarter of, of the Finnish population, population believes in the Christian Lord. <coughs> less than a quarter. And for only about 10% religion is uh, very important. What's wrong with Christianity when it loses ground in the developed countries? We have to remember that also in many less de developed countries, the secularization is advancing. Even in many Islamic countries, countries, although the establishment might try to keep a strict control over media and education. The crowds, crowds see, see, see through the lip service of, of the leaders, and I mean here also the, the church leaders, and see, and who see nothing wrong in, in themselves uh, taking uh, forbidden uh, steps. The only important thing is to keep up an uh, impeccable front. This is actually something also in Finland. If you think that the preachers or are not preachers, but, uh, bishops and, and priests think the, uh, exactly the same way that, as they are speaking to the congregation, you are totally wrong. The creeds of the big religions are just not uh, convincing for the ever-growing parts of the uh, population, although the churches, church leaders do their best. As the knowledge spreads that also the clergy is steadily, steadily getting more secularized, it's impossible to keep the flocks gathered. The sheep are ex escaping from doors and windows as they feel themselves even more alienated from the old and true. The study of religion tells us, among other things, that all religions are made by human imagination. From golems, gnomes and alikes, all sorts of demigods and real heavenly gods evolved all over the planet, and eventually a huge number of, huge number of various more and less organized religions emerged. As time passed, passed even more versions developed than the proponents of which religion tried to keep their flocks together through impressive rituals and by trying to convince that just, that just they had the direct connection to the God or gods. Why doesn't the non-theist take the biblical stories seriously? As Peter sits here, I I have obviously no sense of self-protection when I open my mouth about the Bible, but I'll take, I still take the risk. My insurance here is that I won't take part in any biblical citation rally, and that's what Peter didn't want to do either. If, if, some, if one examines the Bible, it's impossible to find any hint of an intervening uh, hand when the individ individual parts were written and then compiled. Although there is good poetry and rules as to how to live a good life and how, to not, how not to, there's so much mythologi myth mythological or fantasy, fantasy stories that when you remove them as sagas, not much is of interest remains. I don't think there are many scholars, I, and here I mean the real hardcore academic scholars, who see the stories of, for example, the Exodus, Noah's Ark, the virgin birth, virgin birth of Jesus or Mary, and his resurrection as anything else than mythical stories, legends. And these are naturally tons, and they are naturally tons more of, the, of these saga-like uh, stories in the Bible. To think that uh, Adam and Eve are historical persons is hilarious. The snake and the apple story is naturally true, or at least a nice one. And the voice from the burning bush is not very bad either. And so on. Scientists do not read the Bible, Bible literally 
as some spreaders of, it, of, of the word do. Some literalists probably only try to avoid the slippery slope. I mean, if you give away and say, okay, that story stinks a bit, you very easily have to admit that there are several other things there that most probably are not true. When the book that is said to be the word of God contains so much that cannot be taken seriously. Sorry, forget that. That is a missing line. Well, all, power, power, all, all, all powerful, all knowing, and all good, God, a God. Well, I don't think there is not anything like that. The ingredients in the Jehovah God is actually loans from many other religions. Nowhere along the process in, during which the scriptures or the Torah was form formulated, you can show that there uh, came, came a high intelligence that was involved and lifted the text at, at, at any higher level, at a level that couldn't be, couldn't be explained by just being a product of the human mind. You can naturally also be very astonished as a good God doesn't seem to be able to communicate with us very uh, effect, 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 effectively. Sorry. The last time was, I think, from the burning bush, bush. and previous, previous to that he was, I think, uh, walking, walking in, the, in the garden or something like that. It's a bit odd that somebody who has planned this whole universe, created it, cannot do, give a better hint of himself. The naturalists cannot naturally prove that there is no, not a God. But as long as there, as, as there hasn't been any hands-on proof or any seriously, serious indication of such being, serious indication or, or serious indication, there's just not any good reason to take any other standpoint than the naturalistic one. The one who makes a positive claim in this case, there is a God or there are gods, has naturally the burden of proof. Who of you think that, uh, that we should uh, leave an intellectual back door open for the possibility that someday the gods of the ancient Egyptians or the Greeks or the Incas will be proven to exist? I don't think very many of you, you need uh, leave such a back door open. Because we all understand that that was primitive stories that people in primitive cultures just, just kept, kept for true because they did, just didn't have the knowledge we have today of how the world works. In the same way, I don't think we have any need to keep the back door open for the Jehovah either. When you argue, argue for your own religion, some, you also, uh, almost always just uh, try to focus on, on evidence that goes in the direction to ensure your previous uh, opinion. That is very natural. Actually, every, everybody who has an opinion in any questions, religions, re religious, political, or any question, if you stumble on, on some information that is against your prior view, you easily skip it. Or if it's pro your view, you take it in. Those with the religious uh, belief have, have so far lived in, in a very reli reli religious uh, environment. And for hundreds of years, it was the only 
it was the only uh, the only thing that was uh, offered to people. Nowadays, when, when you get uh, information at a very early stage, uh, as I previously ma mentioned, the prob probability that you stick to the that's that, uh, okay. the time. But finish your point, please. This was exactly fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Fine. But go ahead. Uh, round no. off your talk. All of it, please. We got to take it off later. Okay. Well, we will have more more time later. Thank you so much, Henrik. It's all water. <laughs> and uh, the following uh, times, you have a five minutes each. Okay, it's true that most people uh, don't question what they've been taught. Uh, the most uh, Finns do not find uh, convincing what uh, Christians say. Actually, most of them are not listening. And most people do listen to only the things which they agree with their position. One of the things I saw for myself was to find the atheists who I thought had the strongest arguments against my view and try to read them. When I talk to many atheists on campus, uh, they tend to go to the internet and read the atheist websites, but hardly ever do they look at websites that give a reasoned response to the questions they're raising. Many people, uh, most people are affected by their parents, I believe because their parents do. Uh, but that's not always the case. There are many people who start up being Christian and don't end up being Christian. And is this because they've thought it through carefully? Well, maybe sometimes they have. Oftentimes it becomes a more matter of irrelevant. Uh, they're not going to church, it doesn't make much difference in their life, they just drop it. In, uh, in Finland, I'm not sure what the percentage of people who say they believe in something uh, but I know that in, uh, in, in the Czech Republic, Czechia, it's about 50% still believe in something. Uh, so they still believe in something, but don't think very deeply about it. And there were two books that came out about 10 years ago, one by Oxford University Press, another one by a publishing house in the U.S., uh, prominent Christian philosophers with short autobiographical essays about how they became a Christian and why they believed. A majority of them did not grow up in Christian families. These are people who are very, very smart, and there are people who are highly regarded within the philosophical community. When I look at, say, Buddhists and Hindus and others, I don't see very many people who actually are a sincere Buddhists and Hindus who are doing philosophy at a very high level. Well, why is it? I think the Christian faith is actually much more supportable in terms of it, arguments and ideas than these other beliefs are. I was asked the question, what about these, these crazy things within the Bible? Sometimes people ask me, why do you believe in the virgin birth? You really believe in that? And I say to them, yes, I agree with you that from your perspective it's ridiculous and you should view it as ridiculous. If I were coming to the Christian faith and didn't already have some other beliefs I had, I'd already accepted, it would be ridiculous from my perspective as well. The only reason I believe it is because there are other things I've come to believe. In fact, suppose I've gone so far as to believe that Jesus is God revealed to us, the virgin birth is still out there, but it's not crazy. So the things which people dismiss the Christian faith for because they seem wild, uh, actually they are wild by themselves, but it's only in a context where one believes God is there, in fact, he's working in the world, that that make, begins to make some sense that maybe this happened. Also, when you see it in the context of, say, biblical history, it matters. In comparing the Christian faith with other religions, it is true that lots of people have sincere beliefs, but to say they're all on the same footing simply is not the case. There are miracle stories in almost every religion, but I think one should be skeptical about most miracle stories. When asked, asked what cases are that are really strong? Now, there may be some very strong cases in other religions that people can inform me about, but I think one has to be a skeptic, but nonetheless be open to where the, where the, act, the evidence actually points. He said the story of Adam and Eve is hilarious. Well, if you think the story of Adam and Eve implies that Adam and Eve lived 4000 BC, uh, I think there's very strong evidence to say that's not the case. But even secular uh, anthropologists believe that all women are descended from a single woman, and they believe that in the distant past, the human race almost went extinct. So almost all of us just are descended from a small community of people and it seems to me it's not a huge jump from that to say that this small community was perhaps led by a, by a pair, Adam and Eve, 
or even that all of us have come from Adam and Eve, and that they were the first people that God actually established a relationship with and were all the sons from them. So there's issues like that that one needs to think about, and most people simply have not thought about them at all. Let's see what else do I want to say here. Uh, burden of proof. Uh, when it comes to uh, specific claims, yeah, there is a burden of proof. A person says a miracle took place, now one needs to demonstrate, although it's not proof in a strong sense. The person says you can't prove the Christian faith is true to man won't believe it. Well, if atheists believe that, none of them would be naturalists because you can't prove it. What you have is a good, a good case being made for a position. And if that case makes sense to you, and in terms of your experience it makes sense, then in fact it's not the, the burden of proof issue becomes rather mute, rather you're going where the evidence leads. Thank you. Thank you. Let's welcome uh, Henrik Sabula for rebuttal. Five minutes. Yes, Peter just uh, took up these uh, my miracles. And naturally, uh, miracles are, are no question for science. Science, uh, as long as I mean, miracles are something so directly uh, embedded in, in uh, religions, and they usually happen happen somewhere else. It's very or practically impossible to investigate them in a scientific way. Uh, and somehow, also the religious experiences, they are very culture bound. When you feel or see some expression of uh, Jesus or God or Holy Ghost or angels. These are all, always, uh, they are not the natural forces that come, come and show, show themselves to you, but, but they are all images that you have been presented with during your whole, uh, all practically, pra practically your whole, whole uh, life. So uh, it's very difficult to see that they are, are real angels. They are just uh, to tell stories or, or Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is actually mentioned very rarely nowadays. It's, uh, and in practice, people are just talking about Jesus here and Jesus there or Christ, but God is left for some reason away. He's not so interesting. interested. About uh, resurrection, when Peter said, said that uh, many scholars be believe in, in the, that uh, Jesus uh, rose to the heaven, even more true is that most scholars do not believe it. They take it all, only as a uh, as a uh, sacral story, uh, nothing nothing else. And if you uh, know the history of the Middle East. Uh, uh, th those days, there were actually many people who rose up to the heaven. The Christianity has just uh, loaned uh, things from left and right. Well, then, uh, well, uh, I'm coming back to this. Uh, that Peter told us that uh, atheists are putting too high uh, demands, uh, demands uh, uh, for the uh, miracles. I don't know what the too high uh, demand is. I mean, to say that a miracle has happened, that is such a strange uh, uh, incident. But you really have to have some very special proof uh, to prove that uh, really that, that, it, that is really something true. I mean, science. Uh, nobody has uh, been able to demonstrate a, a reliable miracle. You know that the Vatican makes saints now and then, but this is actually of, of monetary reasons. Every saint they they. Uh, Everybody who gets a say will be uh, sanctified, will actually mean millions of, of uh, dollars or euros. 
in, in the uh, relig religious uh, business. Ah, I don't know. Uh, notes are so frail as I don't get anything. Else. Thank you. Yeah, that, that one thing. Okay, you still have a minute. So. No, 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 just a, a side remark. Side remark. Uh, then, when, if, if you have enough time here, you can ask anything about uh, skepticism, hum humanism, and, and uh, free thinker activities. Uh, if it's okay with the, if it's uh, enough time and it's okay with the organizers. Right, and I can add here that both speakers will be available afterwards to answer other questions, maybe things that are off topic, or if you want to grab a hold of them and talk, I think they're both willing to do that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hendrik. And so that's been uh, both speakers having their turns. Uh, and now we come back to Peter for his summary of three minutes. I didn't respond to the uh, borrowing from other religions. The only uh, instances where it seems like something is, is, is too much like the, what the Christian faith says, that it, the Christian faith has to have been borrowing from it, the only instances of that from other religions are actually from after the time of Christ. So if you go to a site called Zeitgeist, it'll give you these amazing uh, coincidences. Look at, look at what this pagan religion says. The only ones that are really remarkable are the ones that come from like the second century AD, and I think it's much more likely that they're copying the Christian faith than the other way around. It is difficult to demonstrate that miracles happen. In fact, if one, one is, is, is investigating a miracle, almost always one will either say, undecided, we didn't have conclusion one way or the other, or they'll say it wasn't a miracle. But a scientific investigation never says a miracle took place, because after all, from a scientific standpoint, one can never draw that conclusion. All one can say is that it's a case that's unsolved. So to say, to say that science has somehow investigated them and found them to be false, it's found some to be false, but of course we expect some to be false. Any genuine miracle investigated will come up with a scientific, a scientific investigation saying nothing is resolved from it. Now, most scholars do not believe many of things in the Bibles, but most scholars actually are, believe that miracles don't happen. So when a biblical scholar doesn't believe that miracles can happen, and you have a miracle recorded, duh, they don't believe it. So that's not a great surprise. But when you ask scholars who don't assume that miracles can't happen, and you ask for them to talk about whether it ha could ha happen or not, you actually find some interesting dialogue back and forth within which it's not crazy. Again, the cases that look at, the one looks at the Christian faith are quite different than other religions where typically there's a story which is told, but there's no way to investigate whatsoever, whereas the Christian faith and Judaism are grounded in history and one can look at it. When one looks at the Bible, one sees that in fact much of it is quite historically founded. The first 10 chapters of Genesis is not written as history, and there's debate around how much historicity is there. But for the rest of it, it is the tremendous amount of history throughout both the prophets and the historical books and the New Testament. So one can look at the Christian faith and evaluate it. In fact, the Christian faith actually puts itself out there to be evaluated because it's based on history. And people can say, okay, what about these historical claims? What's remarkable to me is you still see top-level discussion taking place between theologians, both conservative and liberal, where they'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other on, on these issues. And it seems to me that the very fact that that happens today means that it's, it's not the case that top scholarship has shown that conservative views of the Bible are no longer tenable. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I hand it to for a three minute summary. Well, I don't know if I have any real uh, summary here. It's always a problem with you when you have you speak your th third uh, language or, or fourth language. To, to, to stick with or to follow this example, Peter's speech. When I took up just the mention of the discussion of, uh, along between uh, sorry, liberal and, and conservative uh, researchers, well, naturally they can uh, discuss it, but uh, if you Think of the, of the 
historical, historical critical, uh, uh, not movement, but the uh, side of the uh, uh, line of the, the biblical studies, that is the one that is actually gaining uh, ground. Because that is, that is the only one that can really be defended scientifically. And, and most of the, uh, or all miracles, or all strange stories, of which I mentioned all, only a few ones, are, are or many of them are, are loans, I, I, as I mentioned, and only taken as, uh, as stories in, in, uh, in order to get the attention from the people of the time. The stories had to be very on the same basic level as the people were uh, at those uh, of, the, of those in those time. As I mentioned, if there would be something deeper in the in the Bible, if God would really communicate to us, why the heck did He give us only the Bible? If you read scriptures, there are uh, so many uh, arguments there that cannot be valid because they are contradictions contradictory, and there are places mentioned that never has uh, existed. So the scholars usually uh, don't buy, they cannot be so blue-eyed, so deluded that they take these uh, basic Christian stories seriously. They are just metaphors, and people are storytelling uh, creatures and above all, we are story intaking people. If there is not a good story, we don't listen. And the Bible is a good story as such, but not a true story. It's just literature. literature. Thank you, Hendrik. I believe there might have been something there that wasn't mentioned earlier, the thing about uh, places mentioned in the Bible uh, that never existed. You, you didn't maybe get a chance to explain no, that. Uh, your piece. If, you, if you'd like some extra time. To, uh, the rules are that we don't bring in new material in the summary, so we're giving Peter yeah. some time to respond to something he didn't have a chance no, let, to do Let prior. me say, there have been a number of cases where skeptical scholars have said they thought this story didn't uh, really happen or this place didn't exist. So for a long time they thought that AI would mention in the and, and the, it studied, the story of Joshua never existed. Well, lo and behold, they discovered that it did exi exist. And they thought that most of the John must have been written in the middle of the second century. And then they found a fragment of John that dates from 110 AD. So obviously it wasn't written in the middle of that, sex, that century. And it probably wasn't the very first document there. It's probably copied a number of times when we actually found it. So almost all scholars moved to say it's in the, in the 90s now. So time and time again, when people are driven by a skeptical orientation, they give skeptical conclusions. But when they get investigated, uh, oftentimes happens that the conservative position is actually right. And there aren't that many places where one can say, here's a strong case to be said that the Bible is actually wrong about it, unless it's something which is miraculous. And then they say, well, it couldn't have happened because it's a miracle. And again, I would say that whether or not you stand with those, you have to go to the more fundamental questions and ask the fundamental things about the Christian faith, are they true? If you're like me, you actually come to believe that the Bible is reliable throughout. But that's something that you, uh, you may or may not come to, but that's the position that I'm in. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we have a round of applause for both speakers? <laughs> and we're going to open up for questions. Uh, at this point, you can use any language that we can handle. <laughs> Finnish, Swedish, English, preferably. I don't think we have any Swahili speakers in the room. Um, maybe. So, yeah, please do come with your questions. We have a mic somewhere we should be passing around. Wait, there's a question over there. Uh, Henry Savella. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> then we can catch it on tape as well. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my, uh, my question is uh, when it comes to evolution theory and design and the 
what I can, I, I read a lot about David Berlinski, and he, um, when I, I, my question is, uh, I think there is a lot of proof for design today, uh, and um, I think also there's, you need a lot of belief to believe in evolution theory, uh, evolution theory today. So ageism is, in many cases, also like a religion, because you need a lot of belief to... Uh, so I would like to, for you to discuss the design and creation, or Big Bang, we come from nothing. That's quite a question. Yeah. And <laughs> um, we can do some translating if you prefer that. Yeah. Well, I want to answer the question about the Big Bang. Uh, I'm not a physicist, uh, and uh, there are so many, much to see. Uh, you can see, get all the necessary information through the net. But just, uh, and, okay, I'm not a bi biologist either. But uh, if you think, uh, it's actually not a question anymore about the evolution theory. It's uh, evolution science. For example, the Lutheran churches uh, in the North countries, and I think in all big uh, churches in all big countries in, in Europe, for example, also the Vatican, think that evolution really is science. They accept it. There were quite a lot of Christian uh, scholars that buy evolution. They are, uh, and, and who, who are a full supporter of it. I mean, uh, that's, it's not the theory, theory anymore, but the real science. It's, it's a big difference between micro cost, uh, evolution and micro and micro cost, uh, because there are no missing, we can't find the missing links. So but, it's, it's, actually, there are uh, billions or, or millions of missing links. Well, that's not true. No, it, it's true. Uh, when you are looking at the uh, evolution, 99.99% of the people who, who oppose it don't have uh, education in biology. That is a fact. The science of, 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 of biology is uh, so have advanced so far that it's uh, almost not accessible for the uh, average man. Let's just keep it that short. I want to say that the Christians differ a lot. Uh, there are people who take a young earth view. Uh, I myself take an old earth view. I have no problem in believing that the Big Bang happened 17.8 uh, billion years ago is now what they're saying. I also have no difficulty believing in evolution as a process. However, evolution, what science shows us at this point is there was a process. It doesn't say that God had nothing to do with it and that everything that happened happened simply by chance. One can believe that if one wants, uh, but at the same time, that is an open-ended question. But whether or not the Earth has been around for a long time, I think there's a very uh, good case to be made for that. And the general description of evolution is something which I, would, I myself would accept. But the Christians debate that amongst themselves. And you need to recognize that Christians, even Bible-believing Christians like myself, have different views on that. Question back there. Yeah, I continue here. Thanks to both speakers. Uh, I'm uh, working as a pastor in the congregation, so I suppose it's uh, quite obvious already from there where I think the evidence point. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, say two questions to, to Peter Payne. Um, uh, first question is uh, about uh, uh, the, the the B thing. You 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 had several uh, evidences for for Christianity, and you also mentioned uh, pers more personal uh, experiences and that. Uh, I think that uh, most people who believe in God uh, have these experiences. For example, uh, uh, some kind of sense uh, of uh, that there must be something. In an intuitive sense, that there must be something behind everything, or uh, answers to prayers, or uh, uh, experience of leading in, in life. Uh, 
And, and my question is, how would you evaluate these kinds of experience as an evidence for God? Um, and, and the second question is, uh, uh, can't we just presuppose God? Uh, I mean, every day we, we presuppose a lot of things, like for example, that there's a reality around us. Uh, we, we, we could uh, question the evidence and say, maybe uh, this is just an illusion, we live in a matrix or something. Uh, but we uh, usually presuppose that there is a reality, it's not an illusion. And uh, uh, this is quite rational because it's shoot with our experiences and uh, it's working in a normal everyday life. Uh, so, uh, in the same way with God, can't we just rationally presuppose there is God in the same way? Because it shoots with our experiences and uh, it's, uh, it's working in our uh, everyday life. That's my second question. Thank you for your question. And this question was directed at, was Peter. it specifically for one of the speakers? Yeah, Peter. For Peter? Okay. And we'll give Henrik a chance to respond. Yeah, I think that personal experiences make a big difference. You oftentimes find yourself in a situation where you say there's arguments of fo against, arguments for, what do I make of it? Uh, personal experiences oftentimes make a big difference in a person saying, I'm going to go with this. I don't have all my doubts resolved, but nonetheless, it makes sense now to me experientially. I had a good friend who was uh, torn between believing in God and not believing in God, and he was uh, Catholic in background and was uh, going back to Mass, and the priest was reading from the Gospels, and he just had this feeling like God was speaking to him. Now, from a philosophical standpoint, that means nothing. It wasn't a dramatic experience. But nonetheless, when people respond to God, it's oftentimes because there is some sort of feeling sense they have that God is actually reaching out to them. So I think that it's important in terms of the confidence that people have in terms of philosophical argumentation. There are people who believe other religions who have equally strong sort of feelings that this seemed right to me. So I don't think by that by itself can settle it. But nonetheless, when it comes to the importance for the person himself, if God is there and he cares about us, we should expect that we would have experiences and many Christians confirm that that's the case. When it comes to the second question, can one simply presuppose that God is there? Uh, one can, there's actually a quite interesting philosophical defense of this by philosopher Alvin Plantinga. And it's based on two sort of ways of looking at epistemology. And I won't get into that, but he argues that people can be wired in such that they're responding to the truth and they're feeling that God exists. They don't have to have reasons beyond it, but simply they're responding naturally what, what's there and they don't have to have re reasons beyond it. Now for the person who has this firm conviction that it's true, I had a friend who studied philosophy who heard all the skeptical arguments and for him it just seemed that God was there. <laughs> So I think Alvin Plantinga's argument would probably be fairly persuasive for him. For myself, I read what atheists and skeptics say, and I say, ooh, maybe it's just psychological for me. So I need more than that myself. So there is a philosophical defense one can give of just going with what seems right to oneself. Uh, but I think for many people, particularly for myself, that there's a greater need for that. And in talking to skeptics, so that, that you have this sort of deep sense that God is there, is not going to be persuasive to them at all. Uh, they, that's a real fact that uh, people really, uh, that some people feel that they have a connection somewhere. But that is naturally not any proof of anything. The, the, the fact that we have feelings in one direction or, or the other is only proof that we have that feeling. We have a very good imagination. If we are just uh, looking uh, or, uh, or keeping through anything our uh, fantasy brings to in our mind, I think we would uh, perish as a, as, a, as a species. We have to be some, to some ex uh, degree rationalized, uh, rational beings. We cannot just live as what we feel that is uh, happening uh, around us. Everybody of us uh, questions, is this or that, that observation uh, true, is it credible? Uh, 
and, and I have, sorry, I have no, no problem with people, people feeling that way. That's so, if, they get, if they get some satisfaction out of it, it's just fine. And I don't have any problem with uh, Christian people. My best buddy is uh, Christian people. Uh, Christian, Christian man and goes to a church, a Sunday mass. It's no problem for me. But it's just when you, if you want to be, give some uh, argument, uh, argue for your case, you cannot just uh, rely on experience and feelings. The things that you hear some, somebody talking to you, it's very funny that what you, if you hear a voice, it never contains anything else that, than what you self, you self can think. You don't get any high intellectual revelation coming from somewhere about, about, uh, from outside. It's just your inner brain, your, your brain, which is functioning there. Thank you. Let, let me say that there are cases of people who, who hear something or come, uh, something comes in their mind and it couldn't come from themselves. So there's a, there a story that I know from a person in Colombia who had this dream, and in this dream she heard the, the Spanish word el evangelio and didn't know what that meant. And it connects with another dream that another person had and he explained what el evangelio is, it's the gospel in, in, in Spanish. So it is true that sometimes people can get content that's totally unintelligible to them. Although typically when people hear things or see things, it is something which is at least uh, knowable to them, but not all of us. Thank you. You risk starting a mini debate about that. But we have another question over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, first of all, uh, it's directed for, for Mr. Payne. Uh, I will come clean to say that I'm an uh, atheist, agnostic, theist, somewhere around. Uh, I don't necessarily deny God, but definitely religion. Uh, I think it was interesting when you mentioned that religions are not the same, and that Christianity uh, has a special uh, standing, perhaps, among religions. Uh, why is it that it happens to be that the, the Western white religion is the true one, whereas the majority of the world are then uh, subscribing to the wrong religion. And I suppose that you believe in the Bible's message about uh, hell for people that do not believe. And uh, considering that, uh, I again, suppose that you, you think that God is, is uh, omnibenevolent uh, and omniscient, why does he create the vast majority of the world and uh, not to ever hear about him and then when they die he will punish them by eternal hellfire. Thank you for your question. Uh, should I assume that's for Peter Payne? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to a person uh, last year uh, that I, actually two years ago, that I, I debated, uh, and we were just getting over the coffee, and I asked him, does he wish the Christian faith were true? And he said, well, it depends on which brand of Christianity was talking about. If one is the brand, has the brand that believes in hell, no, I don't wish it were true. <laughs> well, I think uh, it, it's, it's, hell is not a popular topic these days at all, uh, but I do believe in it, but I don't think anybody goes to hell for simply not believing the right thing, making the right propositions. From my perspective as a Christian, what is crucial is the person is connected with Jesus, the only one who was holy, and it's through his identification with him that we can be holy before God. I think most people actually come to that through hearing the gospel and responding to it. Is it possible for people who have never heard the gospel before to nonetheless be responding to the truth that they have and actually have this connection with Jesus? It seems to me that is possible. It's not common. We typically rely on ourselves rather rely on God. But the idea that you go to hell simply because you don't believe the right things, I think is a misconception. There's also misconceptions about what the character of hell is, but I'll pass on that. I think there's another question though besides that one before that. Wasn't there? Mm, no, but I can think of an... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's why Christianity is right? Oh yeah, why, 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 Christianity, why, why Christianity is special. The example that I gave was for people who are very critically minded, high-level philosophers who have embraced the Christian faith. 
Uh, when a person embraces Buddhism, actually Buddhism is like, uh, it's, it's very, very different than the Christian faith, for which certain beliefs are very important. Within Buddhism, what's a matter is, the, is a t attaining experience. Now they do believe that there's a unity of one behind everything and that you need to merge yourself with that. Uh, but at the same time, this, it's not a religion that takes seriously argu our arguments. It doesn't take seriously interacting on an intellectual level. In fact, most Buddhists will, will say, no, reason doesn't matter, whereas Christians say it really does matter. And part of the reason why it does matter is Christians actually have significant content to their belief, which are connected, connected to particular historical events. So Judaism and Christianity are really, I think, fairly distinct in that. They're both definitely historical religions, depend on that. There are other religions one might say is true, I mean, uh, Buddhism is not all attractive to me, and there are things that Buddhists teach that don't make sense to me. But a person can say, well, you just, you, just, you, just, you just don't have this vision for merging with the one and finding that very, very attractive. Well, that's true. So I can't say they're wrong. But all I can say is for myself and for yourself, you can look at different religions. They do teach quite different things, and you have to ask what makes most sense to you. So ultimately, it comes down to your trying to evaluate. Well, I like uh, sauna, so I can, I can speak something about, about the hell. Uh, hell is not very popular for the simple reason that uh, it don't, it's not attractive as a topic for the, any church to, to mention. Especially if, if uh, you keep up the uh, hell, uh, the question arises, how the hell can a hell be around if, the God, if God is so benevolent, if, if, if he is all good? And he's, if he is all powerful, how did he let the devil uh, lose and uh, to 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 make the hell? I mean, it's a story that is so, so naive that uh, if people start to contemplate on that, they just might think that maybe the rest of the stories for the same faulty. Yeah, we have a question back there. Mike there so we can hear you. Thank you very much both for your presentations and uh, interesting debate so far and interesting questions as well. Uh, my question is maybe to both of you, I think. Uh, I myself am a, I'm a Christian, but I would like to hear both of you answer to this question. Um, so my question is regarding to the God, God's need to reveal himself to man. And you were both in that topic quite a lot and then also other questions in that topic as well. And, and I'm thinking about hints, and I'm going to ask several questions, but in the end I have two. So the questions before is more like getting you into the area I'm aiming for. So how would we know that God has not hinted in us? Like, how, how would we as men know that Almighty God has not hinted in us? Um, this is just getting me to the aim. Is there reason to believe that God has not re revealed himself enough? Like, is there intellectual reason to say God, an almighty God, should have intellectually revealed himself more than he has? Is there reason for it? Um, and the, the, now we're getting closer to my question, how should he reveal himself to man? In us, as men, in our eyes, how should God reveal himself? What would be enough? Would it be enough if he came to earth? Well, he did. Would it be enough for him to create everything? Well, he claims that he did. My questions are two. So, what would be enough hints? That's maybe more direct to Hendrik. What would be enough hints for God to be an acceptable view for Christians rationally? What would be enough? And to the both of, both of you, um, what would convince you of the opposite position? Thank you. Uh, with a package of questions, thank you. <laughs> Where do we go? Who wants to take this one first? No Everyone doesn't want uh, to. Uh, okay, Peter is prepared. You're so polite. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, in philosophical circles, it's called the problem of divine hiddenness. Why doesn't God make himself more obvious? Uh, and there are several responses that one can give to it. It's one of those questions where I feel I don't have the final answer to it. There are some things I can say to it which I think are helpful. 
Um, but at the same time, I, I don't think uh, I, I see the totality of it. Actually, I think part of it is God's relationship to a fallen world. So I think not only was the personal relationship broken, but also the experience of God's presence was broken. And what God does in manifesting himself in a fallen world, I think, is, 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 is in some ways limited by the fact that this is a fallen world and God works through faith within it. Uh, I do think that what's important is for people to come to trust God. And for God to make himself perfectly obvious would not necessarily lead to trusting God. The beginning of the Gospel of John says Jesus did uh, many mighty works and they believed God, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew the minds of people. Oftentimes when I talk to an atheist, I said, what would convince them? If God could do something to convince them that he exists, but not necessarily convince them that they should trust God. And having more evidence that he's there isn't necessarily helping, uh, helping them trust. But I think, I mean, it's a struggle I question with, at least it seems to me there's some people who could be helped by a little bit. It wouldn't have to be something huge, but God can't do something a little more for that person so that person can be helped. The person who requires something obvious, I think they're not very far, they're quite a ways from believing to begin with. If they saw something obvious, that probably wouldn't persuade them to actually trust God. Uh, I think the question was something, you put it uh, wrong, the wrong way. I mean, uh, it's not uh, uh, up to us to say, show up in this or that way. As in any sort of uh, uh, argumentation, or if they, you have, a, you are, if you are making your the uh, thesis, uh, nobody says that uh, the, you have to put up these and these uh, evidences. You put up your, you bring up the best you have, and then the professor or who checks your work looks at it and accepts it or not. We cannot uh, go and say and, and uh, specify it in what way the the. the evidences should be, or how much evidence. That is impossible to, to take a standpoint there. I can't do it. Uh, I, uh, just because it's the wrong way to, to, to close in on the question. You did the same question, what would make, sort of make me lose my faith? Yeah, both of, both yeah, so both, okay. for, for both of us. Uh, <clears throat> If, if someone were to come across a document from the third century BC that basically had all the content of the gospel within it, I think that'd probably do it, right? I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and certainly it's not the case that if uh, somebody does some horrific things, human beings have done horrific things. So I'm not sure that more horrific things done by, done by human beings would, would affect me in terms of my believing that God will ultimately enter in and set things right. Uh, but uh, for me, when asked what things would convince me otherwise, I've thought about an awful lot of uh, possibilities, but it's not real easy for me to come up with the ones that would uh, dislodge my faith, but maybe something third century BC that has all the content of the gospel in it already, uh, that might do it. <laughs> that was tricky. I must say, Dr. I, I don't see anything more value in the Bible than the poetry and, and some wise words. But they are not, they are not purely human. But I don't see, think, see anything of a divine hand there. And if, if you look at the scriptures academically, John, Mark, or Luke, and this, uh, usually you, you read it from top to bottom. Top to bottom, top to bottom. Try some, some of the times to, to read it the other way. Put them up, uh, and, and compare verse 1, verse 1, verse 1, and look what the differences are when you are looking at reading them horizontally. You will be surprised. There are omissions. Putting them next to each other. Next to each other, yes. You will be surprised how much uh, failure they are. Uh, scriptures are, they are actually, uh, how many, 5,500, 5,700 uh, uh, different versions of them, manuscripts. Who the heck uh, chose uh, just the right ones into the Bible? There are people, uh, holy men, almost like Peter, 
uh, and alike priests uh, and other who uh, made decisions. They were normal human people like you and me. Okay, they knew a little bit more about the theology than I do, but not much more. Uh, normal people make their decision. So why take it? So the whole book so seriously. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think I do want to give that. Yeah, uh, and Bart Ehrman says there's so many variants of the New Testament. There are more variants of the New Testament than there are words in the New Testament. Actually, having these thousands of different manuscripts actually helps the scholar a great deal because most of the variants are very easy to see why this variant is there. Uh, and you can look at the dating and look at lines of, 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 of transmission of various manuscripts. And actually, even Bart Ehrman says that we can come very close to what the original was, even though sometimes in his popular writing he makes it sound as though you can't. This having thousands of manuscripts actually enables us to look at them and to compare and to be able to actually have very good reasons for believing that this or something very, very close to it was what was in the original. And where there are differences where they really can't decide, Nothing of theological significance depends on that. So actually the outcome of these thousands of manuscripts is the opposite of what Hendrik was suggesting. Thank you. We have another question there. I will translate. Yes, <laughs> I think life is quite a remarkable thing. It feels like there's a great difference in proportion for many. For many have a very short life. And many have a short life. Yeah, and many don't get a chance to live. While others get many years to it. And they don't use these years well. So, so the question is, how should we live? So how, how shall we live? For that, for that, it was an, 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 an dunt. So as not to be an absolute. There we go. <laughs> and, and we will end well. And, and who are you asking? Both. Both. So we want both sides of the coin here. Yes. Okay. okay. Can you restate just just quickly what? Uh, you want a restatement from him? Uh, no, no. Just just yes. If you may re restate for him, because your English is better. Sure. Take that. Okay. Uh, thank you for your question. I don't know what to use now. I'll get back to you. Okay. Um, resetting the question. So he's, he's wondering about life and how it can be very short, very long, but however much we're given, how do we make the most of it so as not to be an absolute dude? So, so as not to waste our life. And it seems unfair that some get such a long life and some get such a short one. Så du skulle också vilja att han svarar på det där orättvisa eller varför är det så där? Ja, det är så. Det kanske är om det finns men. I was asking if he also wants you to answer about that injustice. How come some people get a long life and some people don't? He said, well, maybe. <laughs> so primarily about how to use our life well from your standpoint. Yeah, uh, if a person lives a short life and there's life after this, actually there's a much longer story. So the injustice is, isn't as great as one might think. And I actually think whatever length of life we have is a gift from God. I'm now 68. My dad died at 56. Uh, I, this, it's a gift to me that I'm still alive at 68 when my father died at 56. Some people die quite early. Uh, I think God does not have an obligation to give any of us a long life and that what, what he's given to us is a gift. When it comes to the meaning of life, it's interesting that happiness, not in a superficial way, but happiness in the sense of having contentment, satisfaction with one life, is very strongly dependent on believing that how you lived your life was meaningful for the good in the broad sense, that you lived your life in the right kind of way, which actually means the ethics needs to come in from the foundation for a meaningful life. 
And for me as a Christian, that makes things much easier because I can see how ethics comes in as a foundation. Whereas if in fact you're trying to define right and wrong in terms of what promotes happiness, there it's actually interesting. You have to have believe your life was right and meaningful to be happy. And so I think uh, it seems though human beings, we have this desire and this need to believe that our lives are meaningful, not just in a cultural way, but in a universal way. And if there's a person might argue that's evolutionarily wired into us, but that certainly doesn't fit with the materialist way of looking at human beings. We non-believers just believe in one life, the life before we die. We don't plan for something after our death. When it's over, it's over. As easy as, as that. So anything we do, we, we do only for this life. Uh, don't spare yourself for the future life. Live fully responsible, responsibly, without stepping on others' toes. Uh, use your possibilities, your abilities, take uh, your chances. Thank you, both speakers. And you wanted to clap. No. Go ahead and clap. <laughs> uh, we have, yes, we do. Okay, let's. <laughs> He has tried for 10 times. Well, let's let the man see. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm a bit confused. Uh, Peter, that was your name. Yes. Uh, as far as your, your uh, mentioning of evidence and, and proof, and on the other hand, what proof is enough? Now, uh, is your standpoint that whatever science proves, proofs is true, or is it that your personal feeling about whatever is the truth? You see my point there, that if you, you said that, that uh, if there would be found some manuscripts 300 years before Christ talking about the Gospels, then you would change your mind. <laughs> so does that mean that if Science comes up with evidence that whatever in the Bible is not a fact, a historical fact or a fact of being proved. Do you change your mind about that in the Bible or do you still believe it just based on your feelings? Thank you for your question. So let's let Peter, who that was addressed to, have a shot at it. Yeah, if, if, if say there was some uh, archaeological discovery that seemed to conflict strongly with something within scripture, a lot would depend on how important that is within the message. After all, we don't have the original documents anymore. Uh, there have been small changes which have come, uh, come in over time. Uh, but my faith does not rest on there being no errors in details in the scripture. I have enough confidence in, will, in scripture that I'm willing to accept and trust what's there. Uh, but if something were to come up where some detail within scripture was, was emphatically shown not to be the case, no, my faith doesn't stand or fall on that. Uh, I'm, my, if something like that happened, I'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. But my faith does not rest on a belief that God's word has to be without any errors whatsoever. My faith rests on having studied scripture and finding it profoundly wise and believing that God has actually spoken throughout scripture. And hence I have a, a trust in it that comes from my interacting it. Plus, it comes from my trust in Jesus' trust in the Old Testament. So Jesus never says that every single detail in the Old Testament historically is correct but he took it as God speaking and took that as authority for them. So when Jesus quotes the Old Testament, it's not just this is what Moses happened to say, but this is what God said. So he takes the Hebrew Bible as God speaking to him, and that's the posture that I take. In terms of the, the earlier part of the question, 
My initial point was that there is no way in which the evidence tells you how to weigh it. Uh, there's, there's, there's just this uh, subjective element for anybody coming at it. It doesn't mean that everybody's assessment is the same as everyone else's. I think we do have rational capacities which work. And oftentimes people agree that here's a strong argument, even if it's not proven by logic that it has to be a strong argument. So I think it's very important to go back and forth and listen to the arguments on the other side. And then you have to draw your own conclusions, but it's not just subjective. And for myself, it's not important that it's proven, but rather, is it sufficient for me? Is it reasonable enough for me that I can trust it, even if I have some doubts going forward? Is there enough that I have to go on that I can say, this is the direction I'm going to take. God help me with the questions that I still have. As far as I have been informed, uh, there has not been any exodus to Egypt. There are no sources in the Egyptian scriptures, no archaeological or, or texts that uh, indicates that uh, Israelites, Israelites would have been there what is, for how many years were they, uh, according to the script? 400 years. Four, 400 years, yes. I mean, if they were 400 years and uh, that's that, that, uh, such a big, big bunch of pe people, how is, how, is, how is it possible that there are no, no remains telling it? Well, then naturally the uh, very funny story about Noah's Ark. I mean, that is so hilarious also that uh, if you know geography, you know bio biology, I mean, that is one of the top stories uh, I can, or funny stories I can find in the Bible. Uh, let me just say about the Exodus. It's quite popular these days for scholars to say the Exodus never happened. And say what actually happened was there's a slave rebellion in Palestine. Now the slave rebellion, the, the nation of Israel establish itself. Well, notice the slavery, slave rebellion theory has no evidence behind it whatsoever. It's just a speculation. Plus one has to ask, if you had a group of slaves, a large group of slaves, who left and you lost them, it's not going to be written on the walls of your pharaoh's tombs. I mean, it's, 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 you wouldn't expect that a failure is going to be recorded. Rarely do it sort of these, these royal documents, they all, well, this, this, we had this terrible disaster. Even if you had it lost in a war, you simply don't say anything that you lost in the war. So the fact there's very little evidence that way, it's an argument from silence, but in fact, you should expect a very high degree of silence. We do know there were a significant number of Semites in Egypt. In fact, a couple of the pharaohs were, were Semites. So we do know there are Semites who were there. The fact that there is no sort of absolute demonstration that they left is sufficient for many scholars to say it didn't happen. But I think it's because they like being skeptical rather than an argument for silence has that much weight in this case. And it's not absolute silence. There's, there are some things that suggest they were there, but it's largely an argument for silence. About the, the, the ark, uh, I, and this question in my mind was, was the, was the flood a global flood? Uh, was a local flood? Was it cover the whole earth? It sounds like it was a global flood. Now that's a question where if it was a global flood, I think God created the water and certainly made it disappear. If the water had to go somewhere, there would be some, there would be some geological evidence of huge amounts of water flowing somewhere. So when it comes to the story of the flood, I accept it because it's in scripture. Do I have a clear answer as to what happened there? Uh, no, I don't. So I just sort of leave that as a question mark. I accept it, uh, but that's where I leave it. Thank you. Are you happy with that answer? Yeah, I, my only comment to that is that uh, I, I, I totally respect that. I mean, who could argue against that? If that's your, your stance and your feeling, then more power to you. But I find sort of uh, maybe a bit dishonest that in part your argument in the beginning was that there were evidence or that a big part of Christianity is that it can be verified in different ways but in actual fact what comes across to me now is that you say that you believe it because you are you have faith and that, that's, that's quite, I mean, that's great, but it's, it's then all that evidence stuff, 
really doesn't come into it at all, one way or the other. Can I respond a little bit to that? Right, uh, just to reiterate some of that so that we get it on tape as well. So you weren't quite happy with the response and you felt there was some inconsistency between, or that was your question. Would, could you let your faith be disproven if there were those manuscripts and you felt like he said, well, actually, it's, it's about my faith rather than letting it all rest on the evidence, correct? So let's let you have some more rebuttal. Well, let me say, it's pretty clear to me that Jesus believed in the flood. So I believe the flood took place. Uh, was it a local flood? Actually, there are quite a few people who argue that it may well be a record of some major local flood uh, where, there was, where, where there was flooding that took place and sort of known civilization at that time that, to their knowledge, got, got wiped out. I'm not closing that as a possibility, but I'm simply saying that uh, I, I, I'm leaving that as an open question. When I said there are facts about the, the Christian faith, I said it had to be with the, the, the things which are really central to the Christian faith. I don't think whether the flood was a local flood or a global flood is crucial to the overall story of the gospel. So if, it's, if, it's, if someone were saying, well, the story about Jesus or you know, his existence or he died on the cross or even the Exodus, I think is a very important one. If those kinds of things were in fact not, that were, they should be shown not to happen, those would be major challenges, challenges to the core beliefs about what Jews have had and what Christians have had. So it's important for me that there are facts about those core beliefs, whether there be some details that uh, I don't have answers to, I'm, I'm fine with that. But if, if, in fact, there's not evidence for the core beliefs of the Christian faith and believing that God has actually spoken and that he's revealed himself through Jesus, then those would be major problems. All right. Seems like we, we're getting to you now. Uh, my question is, is for you. Actually, I have, first I have uh, two, two. Who are you referring to? Uh, Peter. Uh, mm -hmm. Two rebuttals for your, <laughs> for your origin, original uh, speech. Uh, the first one, just a comment on the, on the, on the uh, bat. Uh, bat thing, you said that, that e even if we would know all the facts, about about what what uh, what a bad is experiences yes uh, we would not understand it or we we, we cannot uh, we cannot comprehend the same experience and uh, then you said that it's it's uh, that means that it has to be something more to consciousness uh, and and I agree in that sense that consciousness is uh, a oh, real mystery, but uh, I don't think that that specific argument. I would say that it does not work because it's it's. Uh, if we take another similar example, we take infrared, and uh, uh, I think maybe I don't know which animals can see infrared infrareds, but in infrared and red uh, colors. But if they would explain that to us, we still would not know. What infrared looks like because we cannot see see infrared. So so I, I think that, uh, but but we still know that it's a physical process. And that's yeah. That was one one point. And uh, the, other, the other 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 thing was about the resurrection of, of Jesus. You said that it's circular reasoning of from the atheist point of view when when. Uh, Atheists assume that that resurrections cannot happen, and that's why they are highly improbable. Uh, that's why that's why that's a, a, a not a functioning explanation to that. Uh, I would say that the circular reasoning is happening the other way uh, because. We can, from science perspective, we can say that, that um, at least that the resurrections happen very rarely or, or are highly improbable. While we can, we can see that every other factor that 
and every other factor, factor in, in that story could be explained by psychological things and, and um, hallucinations and uh, the, uh, the fact that, that stories change when you tell them to other, uh, other people and they, they spread them forward and so on. These are things that we can actually uh, we can prove, but but yeah. So so that's a, that, that's something that we can assume. That's our baseline. That these things happen, and then we can can say that these would could possibly explain the, the resurrection or the the empty tomb and, and these things. Yeah, so I think that was the, that was the issue. Thank you. And so that was for Peter. Give you a chance to respond to that. Yeah, I think the bat case is an easier one than infrared, but some animals experience infrared. We don't actually know what it's like for the animal experiencing infrared because what we do is we put infrared, we make it red, we put it on our color spectrum. Uh, however, we're quite close to what that would be like because we can imagine so sort of other colors that we don't see right now and it may be like another color, but it would be different. But when it comes to echolocation, that seems radically enough different than what vision is like. Uh, that it's where we're farther from uh, from knowing what it's like. So the, the question there is whether there actually are facts about what it's like to be a bat. If there are, and they're not just sim not just simply can be summed up by the physical facts, then the argument that everything is ultimately physical has a, a serious problem. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm responding to your question there or not. Or I, well, I'll do the second one. You can come back perhaps. Uh, the, the second one had to do with the resurrection. When I talked about circular reasoning, is I was about how high the bar of evidence needs to be. Uh, when it comes to the case for the resurrection, the historical case is a matter of coming up with some facts and let's, let's see what kind of explanations we come up with. So you list all the explanations you come up with. You're not guaranteed to have all of them. So a naturalist might say, well, none of my explanations fit with what the facts are by facts or what scholars agree to. But there must be some explanation I haven't come up with yet. And part of the reason why they would say that is because, well, dead men don't rise. And I don't know if you're suggesting that maybe Jesus actually could rise and there'd be an explanation for that. There is the question of legend developing. Uh, there's, I, I take too long to go into the specifics, maybe, maybe talk to you afterwards. But the most common explanation is to give a combination of legend and then hallucinations. And the reason why hallucinations are, in the, are introduced is because we the, know from Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, written around AD 54, that he had received from the leadership in Jerusalem, from Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, the reports about people having seen Jesus after the resurrection, after, after, after he was crucified. And we know that had to be within five, six years after the fact, which isn't enough time for legend to have developed. And for Peter to communicate to Paul that all these witnesses had taken place and convince the most skeptics that there must have been some kind of experience that they had, and hence they'll say it was like a hallucination. There are a whole bunch of problems that come in trying to make the hallucination fit what's there. And that's where the difficulty comes in coming up with a naturalistic explanation. But it's a matter of where you really have to look at all the different sort of explanations one might give and ask, uh, what do we have a good natural explanation for it? And I would say we don't. That doesn't prove that, the, that Jesus rose from the dead, because after all, there's no proof of that. But in terms of explanatory power, the belief that Jesus rose from the dead has much more explanatory power over the facts than any of the other explanations do that we have currently. Do you want to say something? Scientists are, don't, they don't believe in any resurrection. The pro most plausible explanation why the corpse wasn't found is that it was thrown in the mass grave. Crucifying was not a very rare uh, type, uh, rare uh, occurrence. 
Occurrence, yes, yes. Uh, or a type of how to, how to uh, kill people, execute or, or kill or, or torture people. There are tens of thousands of, 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 uh, of uh, crucifixions to crosses or poles or trees. And only one of these counts. It's a bit odd. I mean, if you have a benevolent uh, God who wants to give all sins, to forget, uh, to forgive all, all sins, I'm, I'm pretty surprised that he didn't come up with a more humane way of doing it. He did the same things, the same thing that the Romans had done previously and did after that, in tens of thousands of uh, occasions. It's a bit, I mean, I have a bit uh, more imagination than God in this case. Then the consciousness. Consciousness is so difficult uh, to, to grasp that we all here are the, the wrong people to discuss it. It's so complicated. It's easy to have opinions about it and you can uh, exchange words about it and they can do some of you more and less wise, but uh, nobody here has the capacity to say anything very wise about it. We are all laymen. The most secure opinions you get uh, about various things you get from the layman's mouth. Yeah, let me say, most scholars don't agree with the mass grave hypothesis. Uh, it's true that people who are crucified were often dumped in a mass grave. But we have a couple of different references to, uh, to Joseph of Arimathea's tomb being the place where Jesus was laid. And because Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling Jewish group, to say that he was buried in Joseph Arimathea's tomb would be something that'd be very easy to disprove. You just go to Joseph Arimathea and ask, well, is he near tomb? So most scholars agree that it wasn't a mass grave, but he was actually placed in Joseph Arimathea's tomb. Uh, when it comes to the, well, we don't know the answer to, to conscious states, that's true. But it's not simply that some issue we don't have an explanation for. The problem is, even if we knew exactly what's taking place in the brain, say when I'm feeling pain, that wouldn't tell us why we're feeling pain. Even if whenever you feel pain, this is happening in the brain, and only when this is happening in the brain do you feel pain, there's nothing in terms of scientific categories that says, of course there's pain. It's like if you wire a computer a certain way, of course the computer's gonna feel pain. That doesn't fit with our category. So to be able to fit conscious states into science it's going, to it's going to entail a radical change of the categories we use. Well, that's what makes it so different than other kinds of things we don't understand. Thank you. We are uh, approaching our time. I see one question back there. But let's let the guy have his question. Hi, uh, I have a question for Henrik in particular. I'm jumping back a few topics, if you don't mind. Yep. Uh, speaking of the, the topic of uh, living a good life, how you should live your life, considering if you have an eternal life awaiting or not, I have a question for Henrik. Uh, would you like, like to specify how would you define a good life, and why should you live it if, you, if it doesn't matter in the end? Because according to naturalism, you don't have, you have no objective moral obligation to other people. That's at least my, my view of it, if you'd like, like to comment. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And the The reason why we are doing good things is very simple, actually. If we, don't, we wouldn't do good things, we wouldn't be here. Humanity wouldn't, never, would never have a, a risen to this level. The good, to, do, to do good things is a natural thing to do. We are bi biologi biologically that way. Uh, almost everything you do is good, half good, quarter good, or neutral. 
Only, ver only very few times do you do something evil. But the evil things, whether you do it or somebody else, they stick out, they make headlines. They're, they are the real exceptions. When you, uh, you have one uh, deed of terrorism, you face it five days in 50 uh, media, you lose the per perspective. We have never been living in, in such a good environment as we are doing now. So you have to be, you have to see the proportions here. And then, uh, what is a good life? That depends on, uh, that's a different for different people. I mean, as I said, we have only one life here. If I, I do not do good things uh, because I have to do it, it's, uh, for all of us, it's a natural thing. More, very much of, of those things that we uh, uh, feel that are bad, for example, killing another human. They are so, uh, deeply wired uh, in, in our, encoded in our DNA not to do. If they were, we, we wouldn't have a, a apprehension to do it, there simply wouldn't be any, any of us here. Is we, uh, not to give, uh, not to kill our uh, kins uh, or, or others of our same species is embedded also in the uh, genome of, of prim, uh, other primates. All social uh, animals have the same, or the same kind of say, the same uh, ingredients, and uh, not to kill uh, kins. I mean, the, when you see a small child be molested, you don't think. Then that must be bad. You have that feeling. You feel sick. Without any, it comes directly from from. It's an automatic uh, response. Let me say we do know that primates sometimes do kill other primates. Sometimes. And from an evolutionary standpoint, whatever is going to pass on your genes is something that will be included in the population. If it's a strategy that would destroy the society, if most people did it, it would be a strategy that only gets passed on to a uh, minority. Uh, certainly, there's a minority of human beings that are inclined to kill others, that are inclined to violence. Most of us are not, and in no society will you find a majority of people being racist, say of men, or being killers. So it is true that amongst most people, we don't do those super violent things. But at the same time, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's not as though one is good. I mean, good from our perspective, perhaps. But from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, the one who does something that passes on his genes, even if society disapproves, uh, is successful. There was a fertility doctor some years back who discovered that actually all the women who were coming to him, he was impregnating with his own sperm. From an evolutionary standpoint, that's brilliant. From a, from a society standpoint, that's terrible. Uh, then when you went steps away from really the violent things that most of us have some strong inhibition to going out and killing another person or stabbing another person When it comes to doing things which are morally right, but which are not in my best interest And it's not going to be something that's going to be horrible and probably people won't know about it The question of what makes us do what is right when we have strong desires to do otherwise And it's not something which we're strongly wired against it and I think that is a major concern that needs to be addressed by the atheist community. Okay, um, there are a couple of you who want the mic, but I think you've had it. But the, the speakers will be around and you can have at them afterwards. And, and there'll be refreshments afterwards. So please help yourselves right here. Uh, we've been told by the staff that we are not allowed to bring any of that outside. So if you're drinking or eating, keep it in here, because otherwise we have to pay the cafeteria to do it out there. But thank you everyone for coming. Thank you speakers for interesting discussion. And please stick around.